Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. I'm Angela Diffley. I'm the co-founder of the Restaurant Technology Network, and we are here today for a super exciting hour of a town hall. We host these every quarter, and today's topic is a hot one. It is computer vision for restaurants. So I'm thrilled to have a panel of experts on this call. When I was adding up how much experience the panel has today, I passed over the century mark. So we got a lot of heavy hitting, uh, great industry experience and technology expertise on the call today. So I'm thrilled to be joined by my panelists here. So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. We're going to dive right in and get started. Today's agenda, we're going to meet our experts first. We're going to go through kind of a state of the union, what's going on with computer vision in the restaurant industry today. We'll go through some real world use cases. Those are always exciting to understand really what the real applications of this technologies are from drive through, front of house, back of house, everything in between. We'll look at the tangible business value that computer vision brings to restaurants today. The ease of deployment, integration and infrastructure, something near and dear to our hearts here at RTN. Um, how easy are these solutions to really integrate into your enterprise um, and set up and deploy quickly throughout your enterprise? We'll look at the considerations and challenges of this technology, and then we'll talk a little bit about future possibilities. What might computer vision applications look like, you know, five, 10, 20 years from now? <laughs> we'll get a little wild when we talk about what the future may look like to the industry. Um, so I want to introduce my, my panel and my moderator. So today our speakers, I'm, I'm so excited that we have all of these, these fellows on, on board taking their time out of the day to talk to us. We have Tim Tang, who's gonna be moderating our discussion. Tim Tang hails from Hughes. Hughes has provided managed network services and digital media for 50 years. It integrates computer vision and digital into digital menu boards and also um, into field service tools to evaluate on, on site support. Tim's been helping enterprise customers unlock business value of technology for 30 years, 30 years of experience. We got Tim Tang asking the questions as he's still known to do so well in the industry. We have John Donnelly with DTIQ. DTIQ has been in business for 25 years and developing software products that leverage AI, machine learning, and computer vision for over a decade. John has been working in the space for over a decade. So welcome, John. We Thank have you. Jim Sherrill at Solink. Uh, Solink has scaled to 20,000 customers in the decade that it's been in business. Jim Farrell has been helping companies adopt new tech for over 20 years and specializes in video software as a service or VAS. VSAS, is that how you say it, uh, Jim? Yeah. yeah, you got it. Welcome to the call, Jim. We have Jason here from I3 International. I3 International has been around for 37 years and has been working on computer vision since 2003. Jason's been in the restaurant industry for 17 years. Welcome, Jason. Yeah. And then we have Luke. Luke Irving from Fingermark. Fingermark has been around for 18 years with computer vision serving QSRs since 2016. At the age of 25, Luke founded the company and eight years ago, he disrupted the legacy Luke timing market with the company's drive through analytics platform. So Luke, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. With that, I'm gonna to toss it over to Tim Tang, who's gonna kick off our discussion today. Tim, take it away. Hey, thank you very much, Angela. And welcome everybody, welcome to our show. Uh, very uh, eager to have this conversation. Uh, when I think about how technology is changing the restaurant industry, you know, a lot of things are kind of moving very quickly in this industry. When we look at natural language processing, when we look at robotics and the like, Computer vision, I believe, is one of those technologies that is ripe for making some very meaningful disruption in this uh, in this industry. And today's uh, topic, and with these uh, experts that we have here today, we're going to kind of go through this step by step and hopefully provide you not only a, a picture of kind of what uh, the opportunity looks like today, but then also how to execute against that picture and execute against that vision and to start to unlock some of the business uh, value that we have today. Let's let's start with the, maybe the state of the union in terms of computer vision in the restaurant industry. Luke, if I could ask you to maybe kick us off here, can you kind of give us a, an overview of kind of where is computer vision in the restaurant technology in the restaurant industry? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, like I think we're we're and I think all of the uh, the panelists would agree. I think we're starting to hit a bit of a tipping point. I think the uh, you know if you look back from when we started. Uh, developing computer vision technology, it was sort of eight years ago, you know, still then it was probably deemed the wild west, um, where you didn't have big tech players 
um, you know, really backing the technology. It was more of a sort of an R and D sort of like sort of throw things against the wall sort of situation. And it certainly was for us a lot of learning, a lot of errors to get uh, to get right. We started we started in the drive through, um, and we sort of followed the money. We saw bigger opportunities to to improve on the existing technology that were there. And I think, you know, today that is probably one of the areas where I would say is, is being, computer vision is being adopted, being tested as a starting point. Obviously, it doesn't stop there. It's, it, it can go 360 degree view across the restaurant. Um, but, uh, but in terms of true AI, I think that's where um, it feels like the, the, the bigger brands are going, well, this, this is an easy use case. Let's, let's give it a go. But it, um, as I say, it, it, it is really stretching across the restaurant now and there's use cases being throw an indoor, um, back of house, in particular inventory tracking. So, you know, it's it's great to see the energy being put into this. And certainly from a from an, a CEO's perspective, um, from, a, from a, a brand perspective, he needs to be making some wins in AI, and this is a really nice place to start. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would jump in and agree. I think drive-through is really applicable, right? Most of these restaurants, you know, are doing 70% of their revenue in that, that area. Um, and I think Fingermark specifically has been so focused there that they have kind of led the rest of us too in a lot of ways into, you know, how that can be done. And I think that there's a momentum that you're talking about, Luke, that we feed off each other too. We are, you know, at some level all competitors, but we're here today because the advancement of this towards, you know, a $80 billion global computer vision kind of AI market. Um, when you think of security surveillance and cameras and businesses like this, I mean, there's just endless opportunity for businesses like us but there's there's a lot of restaurants to cover too and and none of us are going to do exactly what everybody wants us to do but various brands will find affinity to these various technologies and then us pushing each other forward will push the technology into day-to-day -day use cases more more seamlessly for those restaurants for us it you know outside of drive through using these cameras as sensors for alarms has been a big win for us it's mm -hmm. been something that our customers have asked for in and outside of restaurants and so the, the, yeah, I, I agree, Luke. I think the use cases are even on probably only half of what we're even thinking today because the customers are still uncovering new things that we see. And, and we'll see at places like Murtech in a couple of weeks and others where it evolves the more we talk with the customers about their needs. 100%. So we've, we've gone through the same thing with the drive-throughs and that's where a lot of this has started for us as well is getting it, not drive through sorry, but speed of service. We did it from the opposite end. We started speed of service on the interior and now have moved it to the exterior stores. And one of the big things people keep coming back to us with as well to add on to it is labor optimization. How can we make sure that the current people in my store are doing what they need to do instead of adding more resources? Yeah. Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good point, Jason. Labor optimization in general, I think, is is where I think, you know, the, the brands are seeing some real wins. Like how can we send the right message to the right person at the right time, which can, can uh, you know, help um, whether it's labor positioning um, or, or just understanding from a retrospective analysis perspective, what went wrong in a shift where, you know, you're dropped on your targets and, and you know, so it can be real time. It can also be re retrospective. And I think that's the beauty with vision analytics in, in general um, which which is opening up opportunities for improvement across you know mass scale restaurants um, and uh, yeah so it, it, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment and it's certainly taking us into different areas of the restaurant is is around the implication of you know what's what's creating bottlenecks you know what is why is this happening and so using cameras to actually use the data in the drive through but actually using cameras to actually understand and detect in certain areas of the restaurant, uh, we call it seeing around corners. Um, and so implication, cause and effect, and that's what we're really interested in. So computer vision is the tool, right? And you've got to get that right. You've got to, accuracy is very, very important here. Um, and that's what we're all striving for. Um, but on top of that is what do you do with that data? And that's the key to it. And that's where you're going to have the biggest impact and turn the dial in these restaurants. Yeah, I would I would tend um, to agree. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry. I was gonna, I was going to yeah, say from on. from DTI's perspective, obviously as uh, as Angela said, we've been in business now for you know over twenty five years with about fifty thousand customers globally, and obviously have have had a lot of experience 
uh, building our technology uh, from the get-go, and it continues to evolve around computer vision and um, this whole area of AI. And so our, our, our suite now, I think as somebody else mentioned, we started obviously with suite of service inside the restaurant, but our suite now basically covers um, uh, you know front counter service as well as drive through operations as well. So we're looking at AI and computer vision for speed of service because most customers that we talk to, you know, they want to know you know how many people are entering their locations, when they're waiting for their food, how much time it's taking, um, you know peak times, et cetera. And uh, you know I, I think it's 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 a key element for us to look at that for, in, from, a, from an inside speed of service perspective, and certainly from the from the drive through side, it's certainly looking at you know people that are driving off and leaving or whatever depending on the uh, number of lanes at a drive through. So. Now, our technology obviously helps people to to monitor all of that and continues to evolve. So we're, we're excited about it. You know, when we think about the technology innovation, I think one of the things that I've uh, learned over my 30 years is to, to really focus on the pain points of the industry. Uh, that's what's the driver. Uh, take the natural language processing, right? The drive-through ordering, being able to basically say, hey, we can actually accelerate the ability for customers to basically do their orders, improve the accuracy, maybe even give them other kind of multi-language capabilities, experiences. We can solve for problems. When you look at the restaurant industry today, we have a very challenging economy. We have a labor shortage. Uh, we have rising minimum wage. What, from your perspectives, as you start to think through about the business value, of, and we've touched on some of it, but I'd like to maybe drill down a little bit deeper. Where is the business value? What pain points are we solving uh, for the restaurant industry? Um, uh, Jim, could you kick us off, please? It's a long, long list. I think, you know, you look at, at the end of the day, it's dollars and cents business, you know, in a lot of ways, especially when you're getting into these franchise systems, where there's a royalty to pay, there's a margin, the, the, the one side of a brand is focused on top line revenue, another side of a brand that's focused on bottom line, um, you know, revenue, if you look at it from those perspectives and owner operator versus corporate, you can go up and down that stack and there's tangible areas, but yeah, you know, anywhere where you reduce the number of people you need to do the task. And that can be, you know, your frontline workers serving customers, but that's back of back office too. Like you can apply AI, you know, to, to the transaction data, you know, DTIQ um, and, and I3 and us, that's, that's, you know, we all specialize there. We all compete there on transaction data. So you can kind of look at AI anywhere, but computer vision specifically, it's about the customer experience for tangible benefits. So anytime one of our customers can kind of relate that to a story, there's an ROI number, that's great. You're going to say, you know, 20X ROI, that's awesome. But I think what's compelling for a lot of people is we're all consumers of these products and these these goods and, these, and this great food too. And we know what it's like to have a bad experience and we know what that can do to brand loyalty. And I, I think you can put all the loyalty apps you want, but true brand loyalty is about having a great service, predictably great service every time. And the biggest benefits we've seen are that the impact on the end consumer because of what the technology gives. It's a big area when we start to get into privacy concerns with video too, which I think we talk about a little bit later, but that area of you got to find a way to provide a value all the way through to the consumer. And it's got to get all the way there so that they adopt and accept also these new technologies. It kind of goes all the way through the chain of the journey and not just the actual operators or the brands, but the, but the consumers themselves. So we've got endless examples of where that is kind of the, the output at the end, you know, it's a simple little note back about an experience that AI helped make that experience special speed, whatever it is. Hmm. Yeah. I think it, it's a, it's a good point. And, you know, to, to, to sort of hone in on that, the, you know, we, we see computer vision as, as a, as a staffing tool, simple as that. It, op it optimizes efficiency and the, the, the byproduct of that is, is a better customer experience. You know, if you can optimize on, on your staffing, um, extend potential, as we call it, um, you know, you, you, can, you can deliver food to your customers at a, at a lower price, which means that hopefully then, you know, you're, you're going to be delivering um, product to them at a lower price. But at the same time, like, you know, we call it also um, cents and seconds, right? QSR, convenience, and at, at, a, at, a, at a good price. And... So it's computer vision. I, I, I personally do not believe there's a better tool that can deliver on both those things. And, you know, throughput is everything. So one of the things that we saw when we put in, you know, highly accurate data into the drive-through, but this is like counting cards correctly, timing cards correctly at a high 90s threshold. We saw trust in that data 
from the from the 15 year olds that are under pressure and using it so you know we really think about our customer as as that that teenager that you know that many of the people on, on this call will have kids that work in qsr and you see them come home after their shifts they're absolutely knackered but it's it's a great environment for them to learn to set them up but how do we make their life easier and better by um, doing the heavy lifting in terms of data analysis but then dumbing it down for them to understand and actually perform on so performance is everything and when you and when those staff members perform we see direct correlation to improvement of throughput certainly in the drive through and that's really awesome uh, one of the interesting things that I would finish on here is is that one of the things that we're doing now is, is doing sort of exit interviews with a lot of our, our um, staff that use our technology. And it's fascinating to, to understand, you know, how they're finishing their shifts prior to installing our technology. They're more satisfied. They're actually hitting their targets. They're, they're getting bonuses. You know, they're, they're less stressed. They're doing more work with less pressure because we're giving them information earlier so they can make decisions faster and and a better decision in general. So that's something to think about. It's, it's the human, it's the human factor around it. It's the social factor that that this technology plays into. And that's really important, especially when you're struggling to get um, retained staff, that's for sure. And and we're just did you say expanded potential? Related. I was just gonna double click on something you said there. You, you said expand yeah. potential. Ex Can you unpack that just a little bit? Extend potential. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what is that? Uh, they caught my ear. Extending so, extending potential is basically giving a, somebody a, a, a superpower, you know, through data nice. that allows them to perform better than they would without it. So it's it's giving them a turbo boost, man. And and, and it does. Like if you get it right and it, that data is accurate and it's the integrity is high, they they get a turbo turbo boost from it and they want more of it and they want this, they want that. Can we do this? Can we do that? It's, it's cool. It's a great space to be in, man, when you're getting your customers giving you ideas about how they think they can perform better. And that's what it's about, man. It's just totally focus on, on you know, get, and, and I think that's a really important piece to talk about is, you know, this thing is not, the computer vision will augment operations. So this is absolutely about business logic. You, that the customers will get the best out of this technology when they feed in the operations team, cross-functional teams are feeding into this implementation. I think we talk about it more about later on, which we can dive into, but it's it's a partnership and that's how you get the best out of this technology. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think ultimately when we think about, um, you know, what DTAC was providing customers, it's all about, you know, actionable insights and kind of bringing these things to the surface to, to allow people to, to act, um, you know, within their operation and to make their business better um, and see the ROI from the things that we're bringing forward. So the idea of that certainly, and we've seen this recently with a number of, you know, large drive-through impl implementations um, where we're replacing, nobody on this call, but uh, other other folks that are doing drive-through that um, we're replacing, where, where situations where QSR is seeing, you know, massive amounts of cheating going on with the existing system. And they're trying to find better ways to, uh, to train staff to, as someone alluded to, enable staff managers to, to make their bonuses, et cetera. So being able to see something like that and being able to, you know, action upon it, I think is something that, you know, DTIQ prides itself in, in terms of en enabling customers to, to take action from things that they see. Um, so we see this across all of our largest brands uh, kind of daily. Um, and the technology as it evolves, certainly around computer vision, you know, it, it obviously gets smarter, right? It can, the, the AI inside gets smarter, it learns more um, over time. As, sees more things, so it starts to see things that look like, you know, suspicious transactions and starts to, you know, be, be able to service those types of things faster so people can act upon those insights and and make changes. And one of the big things that we talked about was time, whether it's time for the speed of service for the customers. But what we do a lot with this computer vision is we're saving time for the business owners. We're saving time for their managers. All the information that we provide them helps them do their job in a faster way. Because I'll go with the loss prevention angle because three of us do it. The three of us will provide them with reports that have, hey, you might want to look into this. That's right. Instead of sitting yeah. back and saying, uh, I don't want to review my camera system because I don't want to watch 24 hours. No, no, no. We now brought it down to you that you only have to watch maybe five minutes, 10 minutes. And by doing this, 
it saves you time, which then you can get out there and help your teams out when it's for speed of service. Yeah, right. five we, transactions we, 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 instead of two thousand. Yeah, that's right. It's, no, we have a full too much team. to consume. No, totally. And we have a full audit team that helps to. So it's obviously it's a, there's the software itself. There's the obviously the hardware involved. Certainly on the people side, the operation. We have people that have a lot of previous QSR retail convenience, you know, kind of experience looking at uh, all these videos and kind of a lot alongside the the POS integration, trying to figure out, um, you know, what's really happening. And so we provide that as a service as well, so that people have. Uh, and can kind of can trust that we've got experience looking at kind of what doesn't look correct or what doesn't look right, and it certainly can be used obviously um, around loss prevention, around fraud, and certainly around helping to uh, you know do better employee training as well if, if it's required. So it's not always negative, but certainly looking at ways to make sure people are doing things properly, have the right uniforms on, et cetera. So all those things are are part of it, and just make, making the business again. It's all back to you know what's the ROI our customers are seeing from this, and again. You know, we, we provide that ability with the actionable insights and they have to obviously make the changes operationally to uh, to benefit from those. But uh, customers seem to be you know ripe for really kind of looking at this technology in a, in a big way around computer vision. You know, when you. We look at the, what's going on in the restaurant industry right now, there's a almost quiet, desperate need to improve the profitability of the restaurant business. And so yeah. what I'm hearing you guys say is, you know, with computer vision, we can we can reduce our costs by eliminating a lot of the fraud that uh, typically is just normal in the business. And we can also improve our top line revenues but in terms of how we engage in getting more data, operational data about the customer experience uh, in the store, in the drive-through and the like, and being able to understand what is happening uh, from an operational perspective inside the restaurant. Mm -hmm. You know, what I'm so excited about when I think about computer vision is this, almost this ability to gamify that frontline role, to be able to understand, you know, what, is little Jimmy doing versus what little Sally is doing and being able to give attribution and credit for where credit is due. And when employees know that they're gonna get credit for what they do, they work harder. And that's gonna be one of the keys for unlocking uh, more productivity out of uh, a very limited kind of labor pool and, and the like. I think, this little yeah. Jimmy got kicked out, of a, kicked out of a kitchen back in the day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think uh, another area that that is worth mentioning, and and this is a, uh, it's coming up more and more with with um, you know with as we investigate our customers and, and their needs and problems, uh, is is around you know food safety and and compliance in general. You know um, how do you real time audit restaurants and how do you um, how do you just give little pieces of information across the restaurant to a to a single person, a shift manager, and take that cognitive load off his off his shoulders or her shoulders? And I think that's a really interesting piece, and it's certainly an area that we're investing heavily in this year to basically try to solve that problem as well. Now, you know, as a what is it? You, you've got to break down. What does a shift manager do? And 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 his and his shift, and and when you actually look at it. And you sort of pie graph it as a compliance and audit is, is a massive, massive piece of that. So, you know, how can you bring information to them without them having to go and look for it as well? So that's it's, it's harder than it than it looks, but it's um it's it's certainly something if you can crack that code, then then that's going to be an opportunity um, you know, that will scale across every restaurant. It's a requirement and it's not getting easier, it's getting harder for these shift managers. So um, you know that's a that's that's an exciting piece of our roadmap, um, which we're we're having some really really good wins with at the moment. But um, you know I'm I'm sure it's uh in in terms of an easy win from an adoption perspective in terms of this technology, it's like the drive through. It's it's a it's a it's it's got a very very strong ROI. And and you can't have an employee walking around looking at their phone either. So it's like, how do we evolve even to get those insights into their headset, totally. into their ear, yeah. um, yeah. you know, visually to them and not visual to the end consumer yeah, and stuff. It's just going to keep evolving into, okay, now we've got all these great insights. We've got actions we can take. How do we then make those visible in real time to quickly adjust is, is the next frontier of the stuff we're talking about today. A year from now, hopefully we're talking about these are all normal things. People have seen the major, you know, labor reduction costs, major ROI, food and paper reduction, you know, increased revenue. We've, we've hit those things. We see these things in production more over the next 12 months and then making that even easier for that, mm -hmm. that frontline worker to do it in real time versus from a desk, come back out to the restaurant and say, here's what we need to do because I just saw a report on a computer. That's it's got to right. go into their ear almost at some level. Yeah. We're also seeing even like one of our larger customers, one of the Burger King operators in Europe, 
Um, they're now looking to bring this technology and kind of what we what we provide into their business intelligence, you know, infrastructure across the rest of the brand, right? Yeah. So they're really trying to make sure that happens. And, back. Yeah, and start to show kind of the true ROI of, okay, because drive-through is such a, a major competitive um, weapon that people have now. And again, again, I think someone said earlier, most of the revenue comes from there. So the idea, if you can be in that area and continue to help provide, you know, ways for them to make more money in an area that's so important to them and so strategic. Um, and again, taking that data and then making it available to other systems across the business is now becoming more critical. And so we're seeing the need to, to do more integration from that standpoint as well, just to get that data we're providing into other you know, systems that make sense. That's really where the power of computer vision comes in, right? This is a passive way to collect an enormous amount of data now in terms of yes. what's happening in the restaurant and in the drive-thru uh, too as well, without asking uh, a, a customer to check in, log into a Wi-Fi or, or get in, but you can actually now get a, a, a holistic view without really any engagement or any requirements uh, on the end users too as well. It, let's uh, maybe kind of explore this a little bit more in terms of the deployment. Many of you have mentioned the integration, some of the challenges that it being harder than it really looks. Could you start to speak to that? Describe, you know, when you think about implementing and executing on these initiatives, um, what does it take uh, to be successful with uh, computer vision? Uh, John, can you get us started? Yeah, I think a lot, it's funny, I'm, I'm on a convenience store board. I'm actually in Nashville right now. We were just talking about this exact issue in terms of, um, you know, when you, when you think about people and how they're, you know, what, what some of the best use cases are out there from, from our standpoint and how people are trying to continue to achieve, you know, ROI in this area, it's uh, it's becoming critical. So from from a drive-through perspective or inside speed of service, it's something where, um, you know, we're seeing the need for that for that data to be spread to, to other systems, as I said, and, and we're seeing that uh, across many of our largest brands. Are, are any of you guys going to release sort of open APIs to get the the data out? Uh, we're we're planning that uh, sort of a, a a preview that we're planning our API strategy too. Are you guys doing that kind of same work where we do end up because computers see twenty four hours a day times sixteen to twenty four cameras? We probably all upload more footage into our systems than that gets uploaded to YouTube. Like at our sizes, we probably all do that. Uh, the Solink yep. definitely does. So you know is the strategy to then get it out to other systems as insights from video, video out, data in, data out. Are you guys all kind of thinking down that same path? That's just yeah. more of a... Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's huge. It's, a, it's, a, it's really important. Like we've we've seen, you know, a, a world of, um, you know, you know, QSR is, is, is famous for, for um, you know, legacy legacy vendors locking up data, you know, and we've seen it from, from the point of sale <laughs> vendors, you know, it's... Yep. It's so hard to extract data, and it's and it's it's not it's not their data to keep, you know. So we 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 have a very open policy with with the way that we share data because we feel we can send data in so many different ways. We can manipulate that data as well, uh, make better use of it than send it off to say a digital menu board or the other vendors which are in the mix. Um, and that's that's really important. I think our strategy coming from a, a, you know, a kiosk company where we had to integrate to everyone. Um, we 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 wanted to take a different approach where we're going. Well, we want to be the power the power the data player in this place. So we want people to integrate to us. So API structure and API strategy is really important for for us. So we don't have to be doing the integration. Um, you know, the, the partners come to us. So yeah, yeah. It's too many years in the kiosk world, man. Well, well we've all well, suffered yeah. through those integrations, like you said, like really suffered over the last uh, few years for that lock in you talk about um, mm -hmm. exactly. And it's, it's, there are going to be multiple technology systems in these environments, but the deployment to the end user can't be guinea pig in nature, right? You, we can't be testing forever, you know, because then we're going to swap out another POS vendor or we're going to swap out another general system for, for, for whatever. Um, headsets versus loops and versus drive through And like, if it all starts to talk to each other and, and we're all lucky that we have restaurant technology network who helps, you know, lead the charge on open APIs and stuff. But um, you, it's hard to implement these things when every restaurant is a little bit different, right? Even when they're, you know, cut from the same cookie um, cutter kind of thing, they still end up in a very unique place in the world. Their, their longitude latitude is one for every unit. And so, glare or sun any of these things deployment implementation is challenging but if the vendors create open integrations competition goes down a little bit in reality because we can work together to achieve an over a, a better roi 
than mm-hmm. any one product can do by itself. And I think that implementation needs to evolve um, by the customers kind of thinking and not siloed conversations with individual vendors, but actually talk about who you're talking to and ask about how they're going to connect more and more so that open API and open access to data allows us all to actually in- increase the value of our products to our customers by enhancing the value of other products, um, yeah. you know, to in the same in the same vein. So. Yeah. The, other and, thing, and, the other thing we've done too is we, we we basically with our you know customer success process and how we kind of think about implementation we've we've hired you know a bunch of ex operators that are, that work as part of that customer success team now so they've got all kinds of experience in how these systems should work and certainly they they really used them before at their own at their own place or they came here with that operational background and kind of domain expertise that you know, is a real critical um, frankly it's a it's I think it's a competitive advantage for us in a lot of ways with a lot of different deals we're in because. People see that obviously they can buy software, they can buy you know things from a company, but ultimately, you, know, you have the right implementation team with the right experience that understands what they're dealing with day to day is really, really critical. And that's something where we've had you know, great success that because I think ultimately it's helping to build trust and helping to have people that, again, understand what their day to day life is of a, of a person who owns five Burger Kings or what have you. It doesn't, doesn't make a difference. It could be a small one or a large one, but that operational expertise alongside the um, the software, I think is a good uh, good combo for us. For sure, we we've also done something. We brought in a bunch of data analysts from other large corporations. So when we deploy something, we could take a look at it and say, "Hey, you know what? We've started it off for you. We we'll train you on it, and this is what you need to be looking for. These are the problems." Mm, um, right. We've even had it to a point now where other companies are getting us to hire a data analyst for them to work out of our building. So that way they can do all the work for them out of our head office where everything is. Yeah, it's a, it's very, very common where, you know, we'll, we'll approach a, um, a, an operator and, and they'll go, no, no, we've got our, we've got our data team. And I think hundred percent of the time, everything's been thrown back to our data team to, uh, to, to crunch, analyze, and, and we can do it a lot faster. Like it's just, you know, you've got these processes, you've got infrastructure we've invested heavily in the, in the last two or three years, which just gets this stuff out really quickly. Um, you know, we're doing it in real time. Um, and that's that's what they need. And at the end of the day, you're just trying to, you're trying to help your, your, your customers look good um, as, as much as actually add value to, to what's happening on a day-to-day basis. And um, so, you know, part, part of this sort of leads into a conversation around, you know, costs and, you know, how much does this thing sort of, um, you know, cost to uh, put in, you've got to realize that computer vision is only a very small part of the whole um, experience, I suppose. You know, there's there's the, the, the data component of it should be and will be in the future what you're buying. You're, 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 in essence, finger mark is just mo- mo- moving into becoming a data company. That's, that's predominantly what we are today. Um, and and it will and that's where I think that's where you've got to distinguish the technology. Technology should be table stakes in the next couple of years. You've got big players like Nvidia. You've got the you know the Lenovo's. All these guys investing heavily in it. Um, you know that should be table stakes. It's what your partner does to that data um, and how it can add value to you is, is where you should be looking to invest when you're choosing a partner. I would, I would agree. I, I was just, I was, I was, I was going to agree with you. I think the, the one thing I would say is that, um, you know, obviously this industry is is different than other industries where, you know, AI and, and computer vision, and other things have been 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 being used for quite a bit of time now. So I think a lot of a lot of our customers that are, you know, more leading edge, some of the largest brands are certainly, you know, they have a complete strategy around how they're going to get, you know, better usage of AI, better usage of, um, you know, computer vision technology. And so when we show people that, they they obviously think think it's, you know. A new shiny bright thing, which is great, which which we, we of course love. But at the end of the day, um, it, it's still new to new to a lot of these people. So back to the implementation point, I think it's just important that we you know, walk them through how how they can leverage it more effectively. Like I said earlier, um, because obviously it, it's new for a lot of them, and they're trying to figure out how best to justify and explain to the rest of management if they're going to invest in a technology or a platform like DTIQ uh, that 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 has you know computer vision technology and AI and machine learning built into it. How do they leverage that, and how do, how do we make sure that they can like understand what it means and really be able to explain it to the rest of their of management so they can understand it. Cause obviously some people they'll think one thing when they hear a computer vision and other people think another. So uh, we're trying to also just continue to, you know, just help educate people on, you know, the value of it, why it's good um, and how certainly how they have to, 
to leverage certain things to make it work successfully. You know, all of you have spoken actually about the challenge of uh, analyzing the data. I mean, literally now with computer vision, you could be in a situation where you're looking at about thousands upon thousands of hours of uh, video that's available to you uh, that needs to be analyzed. And video in its raw form is kind of unusable. Uh, it's not uh, particularly helpful from a business value perspective or being able to kind of operationally. How, maybe let me just ask the question this way. How would you or how have you seen your customers operationalize the computer visions? What kinds of insights are you extracting out of thousands upon thousands of hours of video? Jason, you want to kick us off? Oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, maybe while, while he's doing that. I think that, you know, even in, in simple terms, as far as as how you do it, it's making it so you're not watching video. There's no way that any of us would disagree that watching an hour of video to to get one insight out of it is, is going to be valuable use of time. So by having the computers watch the video, like literally computer vision, right, if you think about it, and it can be scary, right? Don't go watch the, the Terminator movies and don't pay as close attention to the fact mm -hmm. that the eyes look like cameras um, as I have over the last little bit rewatching those uh, classics. But it's you have a machine that can watch the video and tell you which video the human should watch and why. And I think mm -hmm. that if you just break it down into that simplest format, the data is going to and loop systems and various things. If you talk drive through, they tell us that there is a problem. Sensors can do that. We're slow or we're fast. The vision part of this is the answer to the why. Is it because? You know, uh, a lovely old lady dropped her wallet out, out out of her window and had to put the car in park and slowly get out and pick it up. And that slowed down your drive through for an hour that you didn't recover from because it's ants in a line. Like there's always another car coming. You, you really lose sometimes, especially in peak, the ability to recover once you're behind. That difference is the video, right? The video is the answer to the why. It's it's evidence in the courtroom. It can also be manipulated, right? There's, there's big things that generative AI can do. Um, but when you look at surveillance video, we've got you know X number of frames per second times that Y number of cameras. That is, we have computers that are watching this and gonna gain the insight and tell you, here's the one minute, 30 seconds that will answer the question, why? That's, right. I think that's, that's the key, right? Well, plus too, even, even if you think about, you know, obviously <laughs> we're talking about trying, trying to predict in some cases, human behavior for, for these customers, yeah. right? So at the end of the day, yeah. um, you know, obviously our technology and all of our algorithms are, you know, constantly learning, constantly um, gaining value by continuous, continuing to see uh, things on a consistent basis. But, you know, we're, we're, at the end of the day, it's hard to predict what humans are going to do, right? So I think it's um, the algorithms have to evolve. We're obviously doing that all the time in R&D to make sure that the platform evolves with how people are behaving in these restaurants, whether it's inside or outside the drive through We've seen that with other use cases recently where you know, people back up out of a drive through they're not supposed to. All kinds of things happen that um, obviously the, com the computer uh, vision technology continues to learn and say, okay, is that a good thing, a bad thing? What's going on there? And so ultimately, again, it's about predicting human behavior, which again is pretty tough to do. So I think probably all of us are, are figuring that out as the technology you know, continues to uh, kind of unfold here. I think you've, there, there was, we're still in the process of having um, an element of humans in the loop because you need to understand the business logic of each brand. So you, you've got to inherently understand how they operate and, and what's going wrong at certain times. So what we decided, instead of us going away and, and you know, training a whole lot of models for, for AI to take over, what we thought of through that process was actually bring the customer into, into that learning process. So create a training tool which would detect certain things that we would we would look for and then we would bring it into say like a, a show reel and that show reel we did because we wanted to learn why there was bottlenecks why a a, um, a, a store in kansas you know dropped um you know 20 percent on their on their on their um, lunchtime shift we needed to understand where it was the and you you know working with the customer they knew that it's either going to be here or here so what we did is we triggered this, the cameras to actually start recording in those areas 15 seconds before we started to see a, a downturn in, in, in the performance of the drive through And so we sort of ended up realizing the value of this and also being able to give that to the shift managers to show their staff at the end of a shift to say, guys, this is why we didn't hit our targets. So we actually created a product called Monitor out of that and, and it's, it's evolving, it's very cool. 
but it's so there's we're still in that we're still in that process and, and what we're finding is when we're when we're educating and training on the job with these shift managers, they're just buying into this technology more and more and more. But what they're also doing is actually closing the loop on the training data for us. So we're training things more accurately, faster. So um, it all becomes autonomous. So it, it, it's fascinating. So there's a we're still in that in that training wheel phase for, for a lot of the customers, but the more you can show the results of this stuff as you go, the more uptake and more belief they have in it. Um, it just helps with the sales process, you know. So you have and Luke, are you using? Are you using? Effort. Yeah, I was gonna say, like, are you dumping that into anything generative? Like, we we released Sidekick AI. It's a generative model, right? So yep. it's it's gonna make a best guess on what it sees to give you an answer. It's very, yep. you know, similar to ChatGPT. We use a private version, um, enterprise yep. license, et cetera, et cetera. Are you guys taking that learning and giving it to something that could generate then its own opinion? Of, of the, the validation of what the video sees that's pretty cool yeah because you're putting yeah. that right into that model yeah like get it yeah. right into the product make it front end <laughs> let the let the consumers or the customers ask the questions of their business is kind of what our sidekick is designed and it's going to yeah. learn those users based on the questions they ask as much as the data it has which is yeah, yeah we, the feedback loop a, right is, is ai at its core we had a sojourn through COVID into, into the mining industry with industrial applications around health and safety. And, and we, we came up with that, you know, the, the concept sort of came up from that. And, um, and we realized that this would apply itself in so many ways through, through the, the restaurant industry too. So it's been, um, it's been a, a, a cool little product. And, and I think it's, uh, it sort of came about by, by accident in some respects, but it's got real value. The training piece, the show reel at the end of a shift you know, across, you know, five or six things that a, a shift manager wants to see is, is you know, it's it might be three minutes of, of energy, um, you know, good or bad, that, that they can understand, you know, why they went wrong and, you know, not necessarily who's to blame, but, you know, how, who, who needs coaching, who needs further training, you know, that's, and it, it, at the end of the day, it's all about that performance, focusing on the customer, uh, on the staff member to perform and you'll get the performance with your, with your customers. So, and loyalty, hopefully. You know, I would like to leave some, uh, and just for the audience's benefit, uh, some uh, time at the end of this uh, for you to ask your questions uh, too as well. So please uh, be thinking about your questions uh, and the like. The, this last uh, section, I'd like to maybe talk about the, the challenges of executing computer vision in the restaurant. What are the problems that you commonly see that uh, restaurants should need to be aware of if they want to start to try to unlock the value of computer vision? Uh, Jason, could you uh, kick us off? Yep. So one of the first things is they need to know what their objectives are. What are they trying to, what's the problem that we're trying to solve for them? A lot of them come in and they talk about, oh, I want to use AI or I want to use computer vision, but they don't know what they're really looking for. So one is you need to have a clear objective. But the second biggest thing to this is you need to have buy-in from the rest of your team. Because without your team buying into what you want to do and how you want to improve the business based on this, I can give you every tool in the world, but if they're not going to buy in, you're not going to get the results that you should be getting based on the software that we're providing to you. Like we have, yeah. we had a client who had, they were having a lot of issues with drive-offs. They just looked at it, the problem is drive-offs. Right. When we started looking at it, that's where we threw the labor optimization into it for them. And we started looking and saying, hey, your people aren't in the right areas during rush hour. Your people aren't in the right areas preparing for rush hour. And then once we added all those pieces in for them and showed them the full picture, the buy in came because they saw a significant drop in drive offs in their stores, which is basically revenue just driving away from your location. Now those stores that were receiving that, the drive loss are down. I don't have the exact number, but it went down. I remember one week we looked, it was 90 drive offs for a couple of days and they went down to five. Wow. That's good. So well, um, that yeah, right there, have, think good. of that of revenue left your business and now you're getting it back. Mm. That's right. Well, I guess, Tim, your question, I guess, was around kind of what are some of the challenges too. And I think one of the things we've seen around computer vision and getting it deployed in some of our biggest customers is that 
you know, when you're, when you're, you're obviously trying to get things more accurate, right? So at the end of the day, it's a computer. Um, you know, there are things in restaurants, obstructions, kiosks, light fittings, banners, you name it, um, that can have a negative impact on kind of the overall CV accuracy. So we want to make sure that obviously when we have, whenever we do these types of implementations, that things are just obviously put in the right place, which seems obvious, but a lot of times doesn't get done right at a store level. Because obviously human-like objects, um, you know, can be counted as people. We want to make sure we get those things right. So again, back to, you know, camera placement for computer vision is super critical. Um, it's something that we pride ourselves in both, whether it's inside the store or obviously outside around, around the drive-thru. And somebody mentioned earlier, you know, with glare and, and time of day and things like that to make sure that the computer can actually see what's going on. I'm sorry, the, the, the camera can actually see what's going on. So obviously just, you know, layout is, is an important aspect of this, of course. Um, and like I said earlier, you know, it, it's, we're, we're, we're trying to predict, um, you know, what, what humans are doing, right? So um, it's important that as the computer vision stuff is placed properly, that our algorithms in, within the software can actually continue to learn and become more accurate so that uh, people can have complete confidence in, uh, uh, in computer vision as, as a real strategy as part of their um, deployments. It's being ahead of the curve in terms of your investment in, in the in, in the network too. So you know, computer vision networks, um, uh, you know, or CCTV networks. You know, you can you can obviously leverage leverage the the investment in those, and and that is something that's always on a bill of materials when it comes to a new store. So you know, this is this is just getting it right. So what we're trying to educate our customers on all new stores and refurbs you're putting, even if they're not ready to deploy our technology. Um, that they're investing in the positioning of those um, and we're educating them on where they should be going for the for, for whatever they're trying to achieve. But also um, there's a lot of work going on with our team around education and partnerships around edge servers and, you know, um, building for the future instead of putting in a, a, a standard HP server, which runs your back of house and all that jazz, you know, you're putting in an, a, a sort of a, a GPU um, spec uh, um, you know, server which can run multiple AI programs on it, um, and and you know doing that up front, and so we're starting to see a real shift. We're also starting to see a real shift in where security comes into the organisation. You know, is where tr security used to be this sort of strange sort of security guard led um, ex marine dude that's uh, that's running the networks um, for 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 security and safety. Now we're seeing that's moving further over to uh, the IT division, um, which is allowing, um, you know, a, 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 I think they're thinking differently about what they can do with, with computer vision. And that always helps when it comes to business case and support within the, within the uh, cross-functional teams. Yeah, and that, that's, that's what we've seen too, is if you underestimate costs of technology, like you're, if you are evaluating on the promise, and then you get the price tag and it doesn't fit, <laughs> you know, you're kind of left with a lot of wasted time. And the thing that we've seen and, and we're, you know, we're, we're taking a pretty pragmatic approach at this, right? We also serve multiple, you know, we serve 12 industries. We definitely have restaurants as, as our number one, but we learned something in retail that we can apply to, to, to restaurant and vice versa and those types of things. But the thing that's the most common when people end up, you know, coming to us and going, can you help me kind of fix this? What is now potentially a mess is, they evaluated one technology that they met. You know, there's great trade shoes, right? I'll, 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 I'll pump up Mertech again, one of my personal favorites, and, and we'll see you guys all there in a couple of weeks. But mm. um, you go there, you latch on to one technology. It's got a promise. And almost like we've had people that are like, did you not ask the price? Like a GPU is expensive, right? Are you going to have to put expensive hardware? Do you need a $1,000 camera? Or are you talking like a $70 camera? There's big mm. swings there. And each of us all do this differently. We've all come from different backgrounds. I think, you know, Luke's the only one that started in mining out of all of us, which I need a, a beer and a, and a chat on how that happened. Go from mining to QSR. Um, but it's that concept of like, like anything else you evaluate, treat computer vision or AI or any, you know, anything in the technology category as an evaluation, right? If you're doing it at a corporate level as a brand down to the franchise operators, they're going to, they don't want to be told, hey, it's a $2,000 piece of hardware and four hundred dollars a month, they're going to choke on that. We know that. Like they, mm -hmm. we we negotiate with them. We know that what the costs are. So you got to try to keep that monthly recurring. It's part of SaaS. It's part of software. It's the way of the world. You got to keep it affordable. It's part of an operating expense. Your upfronts need to be realized either in a payback model. How long is this going to take you back 
to, to pay back. Your ROI is, not, is a return on investment. It's also total cost of ownership analysis. Mm. Why, you know, we evaluate POS systems this way. We evaluate loyalty systems this way, all these different things. And a lot of times technologies throw spaghetti at the wall and let's see what sticks. And unfortunately, a lot of it, especially what I'd call like pop-up AI companies, we all like, we are all kind of affected by these guys because they're creating sort of a promise and then significantly mm -hmm. usually under delivering because they don't know restaurants usually it's it's a promise we've all played in restaurants for so long that we know you can't just drop a box and every site will look the same some places don't have cars going through the drive-thru they have a horse and buggy we've seen that mm -hmm. the ai mm -hmm. doesn't know what to do mm -hmm. potentially with a horse and buggy the first time it sees it Who but in the southern it? states and in certain yeah. places you're going to see it you're going to get yeah. a police officer come through on a horse is that make, a gotta make sure the horse gets fed. That's the bottom line. Right? Gotta make sure the horse gets fed. So <laughs> there's all these different things. But yeah, like I think, you know, talking to your other colleagues about what they're evaluating, asking your vendors who their competitors are. It sounds weird as a vendor to say that, but competition's good. We want to contrast, right? We want to mm -hmm. see what's right for your business. And if we're not the right answer, we usually tell people, but the key is you're looking at one product. Who do they compete with? Who are their five competitors? Um, what is that all of their total cost of ownership? What is all their ROI? Now let's prove those things out in POC and then apply it to the Midwest in, in, in data set to, you know, East coast, uh, USA in data set mm -hmm. or California. These are very different places, right. And very different from Australia and, and, and the UK. And, you know, you got to look at it holistically, the way you'd look at any aspect of your restaurant. And what we've seen over the last year is a lot of spaghetti that's hit the wall and hit the ground right after. And it's just a loss of time. It's a loss of trust if you're coming from a, um, coming from a, uh, like a brand versus franchise operator, you end up losing and eroding trust with the, the franchise operators that they look to you to technology direction. Mm -hmm. um, and Phil Crawford, you know, at CKE and these types of guys, like they would talk deeply about this because of that area of like, you can't erode that trust and then bring them under, hey, this one will work. Right. And we've just seen brands really struggling with that. And if you put the right people and it may be us and, and, you know, five or six others right now in the right evaluations, let us fight with each other about it. You're probably going to get the best solution for your business. And that may not be the same solution in every region. And I think that's the reality that as any business has to evaluate things in, in not a wet magic. There's no real magic wand. You, you, know, you might need think, three of them. I think one of the ways to, to, to think about it is there's a meaningful amount when it comes to computer vision, there's a meaningful amount of processing that needs to take place. It can either a take place in the camera, which means then your cameras get a little bit more expensive. It can take place in an edge uh, uh, appliance, which means now you have to invest in edge appliances or it can yeah. take place in the cloud. Uh, but then you also need to think about uh, investing in your network then and, 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 and managing the connectivity from the restaurant into the cloud so that you can get a clean video signal and, and do the analysis uh, too as well. So depending on the philosophy or the approach of the solution, camera, uh, edge appliance, or in the cloud, all will carry with it uh, different requirements in order for you to be successful. There is uh, one question here about uh, data privacy that we haven't talked about. Could I ask you guys to kind of maybe make some comments there in terms of what are you seeing with regards to how your uh, customers are dealing with the issues of data privacy? Yeah, it's it's definitely a real it's definitely a real thing, um, and certainly across the states, you've got um, different states have different different laws, um, and but I think you know being going in with the intent early with your customers' conversations around. You know what are their you know what are their uh, guardrails? You know get that up front early, and so you can start because you can shape your solution um, to be in line with with their policies. Um, so you know it's not hard and fast. Well, certainly our solution is not hard and fast in any way possible. We we manage the cloud on their behalf, so we can have stringent understanding and rules around how it's managed. Um, you know, a lot of our stuff is still on the edge. Um, we manage that very, very stringently as well, um, which takes a lot of the risk out of um, out of data leakage. But um, still, there's there's risks. Um, so, uh, you know, you can you can skin it a few different ways to be in line with the, the customer's policies. But you sometimes it can take some time, um, and you also need the chance to be able to educate them on why you do it one way. So you aren't changing for every customer, but that takes time as well and getting through legal and so forth. So my advice to that is get in early with those conversations, understand the architecture of how you're running, make sure it is compliant, uh, and then you move on to the next phase. 
but certainly in terms of pilots and and the fastest way to pilot is to to run it on a on a separate network 5g bang do it do it that way um and and then as you're dealing with the, the privacy and security policies in the background i mean we, so, we, we we i mean we view obviously data privacy very in a very very important aspect of our business and certainly our customers in the same way and so certainly as you said, across the U.S., there there are some different privacy laws for the most part, but you know not as many, obviously, or not as stringent as obviously in Europe and some parts of the rest of the world. So we take it very seriously. You know, obviously, work very closely with you know customers around our you know kind of uh, large you know master service agreements, et cetera, to make sure that we're you know make you know really um, you know enhancing our data privacy kind of requirements along with what the customer wants. So we totally understand that, and we're obviously being very cognizant of of making sure that um, especially as it relates to to video and, uh, and, 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 you know, facial recognition, things like that. You got to be really careful with how you're, you know, sharing data, et cetera, um, or not, or not sharing data. So it's something that, uh, you know, we take really, really seriously. And you now we, we work really closely with our largest customers to, to stay kind of, you know, close to what some of those issues are. So we obviously don't get, you know, messed up with a customer and try to keep it pretty clean in terms of how we, how we look at it. You can also just work with some of the, the most advanced brands and there's brands like Domino's and others who will put you through the security ringer in a good way, right? So looking to brands and restaurants that are really strong at managing their process and technology for privacy as peers, brand to brand, talk to each other, yeah. put, the, put the pizza versus burgers aside and actually feed off each other. Are you getting DPAs from all your you know data privacy agreements from all your vendors? Are you evaluating for SOC 2 type 2? Who's doing what? Some of the brands we work with, you know, a hundred of the top hundred, you know, they're all doing it at very different levels. If they start to narrow that gap by working together through, you know, through groups like this um, and, you know, Angela and her team and stuff, that'll be safer too for everybody, right? Feed off each other a little yeah. bit. So yeah. could I make a plug here, Tim? There's, there's some questions in the chat we haven't gotten to. So if we don't get to the questions, I'm going to put them in front of our panelists today and let them answer. And I'm going to send them out to everyone on the call. Um, Casey, who's from Jack in the Box is a, friend, a dear friend of RTN and she's on the she's on the call today. She had a question she wanted to chime in on uh, in real time. If we can if we can get you to chime in now, Casey, that'd be great. Yeah, I'll be super quick. I'm just curious if any of you have worked with any multi-unit franchisee type concepts mm -hmm. where you're um, allowing or, or kind of doing a, a proof of concept with one of their restaurants, maybe they have multiple in their umbrella. Um, are you allowing them to do any type of proof of concept to prove out the return on investment? I I think this will, something like this is very valuable and also might be a hard sell for some of those legacy guys. And so I'm just trying to think about innovative ways to uh, get them to bite and be open to the idea. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, we're yes. very open. But obviously for the, for the right situation, of course, to, you know, obviously we want to make sure that the customer understands what their success criteria truly are. Um, and if, if they understand that and we, and we match up well, then we'll obviously do a pilot for them. And I think ultimately, you know, w you know, we've been in business for a long time, so pilot shouldn't be a mystery because obviously the product works. It's more about does it work for, for that particular use case and that particular customer. But we're certainly more than happy to work with customers in a way that um, where, the, where the pilot's set up with the right structure uh, the right, um, you know, kind of, I think, time on the customer side as well as on the vendor side to make sure that the success criteria are are well structured to to what we want to do. And end of the day, we, um, you know, we'll, we'll do those types of pilots all day long as long as it's a good fit for for the customer. Again, we we want to have when we when we do a pilot, we want to make sure that it's a success and we convert them obviously to a, at the end of the day a paying customer. And it's definitely it's definitely a use case by use case by brand, I would say. But there are some standard QSR. Yeah. A QSR is a QSR is a QSR. That's right. So, That's yeah, right. Is there the capability to come in and say, we get you're going to tweak, but from day one, we could put something like this in to give you some insights to understand instead of this kind of soap period of collecting business use cases yeah. from engaged business people. Yes, and I think from, from our sure. perspective, we we take the approach of just give you a benchmark of where, you know, if we're, if we're coming in from a drive-through perspective, benchmarking against loop timers you know we just go well, we'll we'll put some cameras in and we'll 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 time and and count cars accurately versus the existing loops you have in the ground and that that is usually enough for them to it's a the mic drop moment um of how you know the technology that they've been you know and the data they've been feeding their their staff 
is you know is is pretty um it's like giving them a a blunt weapon to fight with so mm -hmm. that that moment that you start to get a bit of tension point to actually move further around what else can we tackle in the drive through how do we put dashboards in on this with this data as it's accurate that's the easiest place to start from from the drive through perspective just benchmark against what you've got from a legacy perspective and with that we are out of time this is <laughs> we have so many questions in the chat and i feel horrible that we didn't get to all of them so forgive us and um, just know that I'm going to get all of our panelists to chime in, and it might even be better that they answer them in, in one email. Everybody gets to um, give their opinions and their thoughts and their insights on the various questions in the chat, and then we'll circulate them those to those people who asked, and I'll also circulate them on LinkedIn. Um, so if you want to follow that chat there, we'll do a wrap-up sizzle reel plus question Q&A answer uh, wrap-up on, on LinkedIn um, and maybe even on the RTN site. So I just want to thank everybody for joining us today. This has been a fascinating discussion. I think we could have talked for another hour. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I'll put it in the chat. Let's do part two. I think we'd all love to keep on talking. Yeah, stuff yeah, and, put it in the chat. Come, come see all of us at, at Murtech as well to keep the conversation rolling too. Absolutely. Don't, don't, don't forget to stop at DTIQ first and then come to you. That's yeah, fine. Go ahead and stop at DTIQ first and then come, come check us out after. No problem. I had to say, I had to get that in there, but anyway, all good, yeah. all good. Well, thanks everybody. And and listen, um, if you're interested in, in continuing this conversation, perhaps we will do a part two. So stay tuned and I'll, we'll be able to invite everybody that agreed to come to this meeting and maybe we just continue the discussion for everybody's yeah. game. I'm oh. game. So, uh, so okay. thanks everyone for joining us and go have a great day. Thank you again, Thank Tim. You. Thanks everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Tim. Thanks all. Thanks, thanks Angela. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.